And I think the recording has started, which is the first thing they'll hear me say, which is a great way to introduce our presentation. Okay, so today we're just gonna talk about some basic investment vocabulary. What I really wanna start with is just going through uh, some overviews of different asset types. Well, I can tell already, I'm gonna have to do this again, sorry. So an overview of some different asset types, equities versus fixed income, really just like what stocks versus bonds, thinking about how these terms are used, how they're defined. Um, and then I'm gonna walk through a few basics of equity valuation. Uh, there's more in the slides that I'm gonna have time to talk about. So some of the math in the slides, I'll leave for you for little exercises, um, but just some basic high level ideas of how we think about pricing an asset. What is a fair price today we'll discuss. Uh, and then we'll pivot to the idea of a market. Um, people talk about the market all the time, but like, what are they talking about when they say that? Uh, it's pretty easy to define, so we'll, we'll look into that. And then we'll discuss how one should construct a portfolio, um, which is closely related to the idea of a market, because the punchline here is you should construct a portfolio to try and beat the market. So the objective when you put together a portfolio is to take on uh, less risk than the market and get a higher return, or at the very least, a higher risk-adjusted return than the market returns. Uh, and then a few bonus thoughts, just the random things that didn't fit nicely into these other categories. Okay, so when we say assets, uh, these are liquid assets, a financial asset. Liquid meaning it can easily be converted into cash, uh, that they have value from some contractual right to ownership. So uh, a house is also an asset, not a liquid asset, because it's not really easy to convert it into cash. Even though selling your house isn't that hard, it takes several months. Um, a stock Whenever the market's open, I can sell it. I can sell it instantaneously. A bond, I can sell instantaneously. So we're thinking of these liquid assets, the ones that are really easily exchanged for money. Uh, the primary asset classes, government bonds, um, we're gonna treat these separate from corporate bonds because it turns out they have a very different role, uh, certainly in a portfolio than a corporate bond does. So government bonds, sometimes called treasuries, uh, US government bonds are the lifeblood of the global financial system. Without US government bonds, uh, the global financial system, certainly as we have constructed it, would fall apart. So we'll talk a little bit about why that's the case. Corporate bonds, very similar idea, except instead of a government issuing them, it's a corporate entity. And then equities, stocks, ownership into a, a, an actual company. So we'll define all these terms as we go through here. Um, bonds, a security that pays an owner a fixed interest payment until its maturity date, at which point the owner recoups their initial investment. So a bond I might buy for $100 up front. It's essentially a loan that I give to the company or the country that I'm buying the bond from. Uh, it's so similar to a loan that it's structured almost identically to one. I'm giving up money up front that eventually you have to repay me. And when you repay me, you do it on a monthly or annual basis for coupon payments. And then at the end, you give me all my money back as well. So I get the principal of that initial loan I give you, and then some interest rate to compensate me for trading my cash for your bond up front. Uh, so corporate bonds, ownerships of corporate debt, literally like a loan made to a company. Government bonds, ownership of government debt. Uh, there's bills, notes, and bonds. They're all called treasuries. Um, I'm sure I'll be sloppy in this conversation and refer to a short-term treasury bill as a bond. Um, they're used somewhat interchangeably, certainly in economics. So the idea behind a bond, you know exactly what you're getting paid the second you buy it. The day you buy the bond, you know the, the stream of uh, future income you're entitled to. And the only way you don't get paid back is if the underlying entity goes bankrupt. So if I buy a government bond, 30-year U.S. Treasury, the only way I don't get paid back is if in 30 years the U.S. government is financially insolvent. That seems like a low probability event, which is why US government debt has a very low interest rate, a very low yield to the individual who makes that loan to the government. Corporate debt, much more likely a corporation goes out of business than a whole country goes out of business. Therefore, corporate debt, you're gonna have a higher yield. Um, but the bond yield, right? This amount, the return you get on the investment, predetermined. Upfront, you know what that amount is. And the amount that you have to get in yield, the return you get on that investment is a function of perceived risk. So since the 19, or since 1980, not the 1980s, uh, U.S. Treasuries have about a 1.7% annual return, uh, barely offsetting inflation, right? They're barely compensating you for not just holding your money in cash. It would deteriorate at a certain rate if you did that. They're barely beating inflation. Corporate bonds, higher. Uh, a higher return because a corporation, as we've said, has higher risk than the U.S. government. 
So because there's a higher probability of a corporation going out of business, they have to offer you higher compensation. And this is actually why we're going to refer to the return on government bills one sec as the risk-free rate of return. Uh, this is a specific term that we're going to define is going to be important as we get into asset valuation. The risk-free rate, uh, in theory, we need some risk-free rate to construct an optimal portfolio. In practice, the closest thing we have to a risk-free investment is a U.S. Treasury. Why? Uh, because a one-year U.S. Um, bill, the only way it doesn't pay you back is if one year from now the U.S. government doesn't exist. Uh, a few years ago, I would have said the probability of that is zero. Seems higher than ever now. Still a very low probability event that the U.S. government is insolvent one year from now. So this risk-free rate, it kind of becomes the lower bound on interest rates in the economy. Because why would I ever buy a corporate bond, which is inherently riskier, if it doesn't pay me some premium over the risk-free rate? I have to be compensated for accepting that additional risk that a, a corporation represents. Um, so once I know the risk-free rate, the bottom end of the market, closely approximated by a one-year government treasury or the federal funds rate, both of those approximately equal, every other interest rate in the economy is some multiple over that. Uh, question? Oh yeah, so I'm just so when you talk about U.S. corporate bonds having a return of like five point seven annually, yep. um, that's average, right? Like, yep, on average. Uh, yep. So, oh, what determines it? Well, what is the exact return? It's yeah. going to depend on how risky the company is. Okay. So, a company like Nike can probably raise debt um, at a very low multiple over the federal funds rate because Nike's a long-established company, good cash flow, uh, has a lot of quality assets both in the U.S. and abroad. Whereas some young startup company, if they want to issue a bond, might have to pay a much higher interest rate on that bond to have access to debt. Um, who decides how risky bonds are? Rating agencies. So I, as an individual, might have some opinions about how risky a company is, but who literally decides? Well, rating agencies assign uh, either investment grade, high grades to bonds, meaning if I'm, uh, again, let's say Nike is an example. If I want to borrow money from the public by issuing a bond, I want to raise cash up front that I'll pay them back over time. And I'm uh, graded as an investment grade bond by Moody's, Standard & Poor, Fitch. Then I'm going to be able to, to raise money at a very, very, very low multiple over the federal funds rate, over this risk-free rate. If I'm considered a junk bond, meaning I'm high risk, there's a decent probability I don't pay back my initial creditors. In that case, I have to pay a higher yield on my debt. Um, and note that this actually creates a bit of a problem that who are the companies who are going to have the hardest time having high enough cash flow to pay you back? These risky companies. And what do we make them do? Pay off a higher amount of, of their cash flow as yield on the bond that they use. So the more risky you are, the higher the interest rate you have to offer, and the harder it is to pay people back, the higher interest rate you have to offer. So it's a bit of a conundrum. Uh, but this is the way to efficiently design our system. It's the same issue if like I as an individual go to get a mortgage, I can get a cheaper mortgage than most of you can probably. I have, uh, I mean, for my sake, I hope a higher income than most college students. Um, but if I wanna get a mortgage and Jeff Bezos wants a mortgage, he's gonna get a much lower interest rate than me. So this perception of risk applies to both companies and individuals seeking loans. Um, rating agencies pay, play a really important part in our financial system. Uh, our ability to trust them or not trust them seems to go in waves. Uh, for example, like the mortgage-backed securities, the assets that are in large part responsible for the 2008 financial crisis were all rated as investment grade, very low risk, no, almost no probability of defaulting. And yet they all imploded around the same time in 2008. So these companies can get it wrong like anyone else, but they're kind of the experts in the system. And just as an example to drive this home, if I buy a 10-year U.S. bond, it pays around 1.5%. Um, it's slightly higher now because inflation has been ticking up in the U.S. This, these stats were from February. or No, I'm sorry, February, from uh, November. Um, but Venezuela, 10.4% annual return. So just this basic idea that the more risky a country seems or a company, the higher interest rate they have to pay on their debt. Equities are quite different. Um, I don't know the future value of, of an equity when I purchase it. Because when I buy an equity, I'm buying ownership of a company. When I own a stock, I am technically an owner of whatever company stock that I own now. Um, there's private equity. These are shares in private companies. Uh, if you can get into private equity, by all means do it. You have to have quite a bit of money to buy into this market. I think legally, 
I don't remember the exact value. Do you remember, uh, was it 1.5 million liquid you had to have? I think so. I think it's one point. There's some amount of liquid wealth you have to have, meaning uh, like, as we said, liquid assets, things that are cash or almost cash equivalents. You have to have, I think it's $1.5 million, something around that to buy into private equity. So for most of us, this isn't achievable, particularly early in our investment careers. Common stocks is what most of us buy. So the stock of a company, any publicly traded company that's on the New York Stock Exchange, for example, when I buy that stock, I'm buying an ownership share of that company. And unlike a bond, where the second I buy it, I know my coupon payment, I know how much they pay me monthly or annually, I know how much money I get back at the end of the terms of our agreement. The value of a stock is uh, much more flexible and determined by many more factors. Um, the increase, we think, for two reasons, fundamentals, uh, meaning the owned corporation increases in value. So if I buy stocks, uh, a stock, let's continue with the Nike example. If I buy Nike and uh, they continue to be a strong company, they have a very strong global brand, they're probably going to keep selling shoes in the next 10, 20 years. If they find new markets to sell to, if they find a way to increase their margins on their product, if their profit is higher, the value of that stock will go up. So there's this sense of a fundamental value will increase share price, fundamentals being higher revenue, higher profits, better corporate, ma corporate management. Um, there's also momentum. So this is something that Keynes, when he referred to like the overall economy, he called animal spirits. This idea that if we all agree something's going to happen, it happens. So if we all agree, let's say GameStop isn't worth $10 a share, it's worth $100 a share. Well, if we all think that and we all act like it's worth $100 a share, Higher demand drives up price, it becomes worth $100 a share. So there's some sense in which stocks are supposed to be multiples of their fundamental value. Um, a finance professor would tell you that's exactly what they are worth, I imagine. I don't quite think so. I think this momentum animal spirit thing is quite important, especially if you look at the stocks that are trading at crazy multiples now. Um, we'll talk about Tesla a little bit later, we'll talk about GameStop a little bit. There doesn't seem to be some fundamental reason these companies are valued how they are. Um, yeah, question here and then either way. Um, can you just clarify why private equity has a cap for bonds? Oh, or yeah, um, I was going to ask the exact same question. Like, is that a legal standard or is that yes. like a norm? Like, there's company demand. Yeah, legal standard. Um, why? Because it's one of the few markets where insider trading is legal and rich people want to keep the highest po return possibilities for themselves. I mean, that's maybe a somewhat skeptical view from an economist who studies inequality but I can't think of a better reason, frankly. Um, maybe the justification is that private companies are much younger. They're earlier in the stage of development. There's a higher risk they fail. So it's protecting you, but I mean, is it really? Private equity is like one of the only areas that has over the last decade consistently beat the market. Um, and it's not something that the average Joe can buy into. This is sort of changing. Uh, there's a few ETFs coming out. So I think I'll talk about ETFs a bit. Um, ETFs are basically like a pre-diversified asset. So when I buy an individual stock, I'm buying ownership of a company. If I buy an ETF, exchange traded fund, it trades just like a stock. I buy it and sell it on the same exchanges. Like I, I have an E-Trade account. I can buy shares in Nike or ETFs. Uh, ETFs though, are essentially a single asset I as a consumer buy that are comprised of many assets. And some private equity firms, because they're recognizing that private equity has some edge over the market, are trying to construct private equity ETFs to give retail consumers like us access to this marketplace. Um, yeah, I, I think the defense would be they're protecting us. Um, I, I don't think that's the genuine reason. Uh, I think it's it's you know very much just a boys club of wealthy people who can afford to be in this club together. And like there are no rules in private equity. All the stuff about insider trading, like all trading in private equity is insider trading because none of it's public information. So it's a lot of like leveraging relationships, leveraging whatever information edge you do have um, and kind of doing the things that would be illegal if it was publicly traded companies. Yep. Okay, so when we're thinking about equity value, uh, so as I said, there's this notion of fundamental value, meaning that the value of a stock should be related to like real tangible things like revenue and profit of a company. That's a really obvious one. If I'm a very profitable company, if I have really good cash flow, uh, it's likely I will in the future. If, if I'm a company that has sort of, you know, a really good business model, I've been steadily growing, my stock price is going to be increasing because that growth can be projected out in the future. New opportunities for growth, another thing that can drive up stock value. 
Um, that's why like young tech companies are valued really high relative to their current earnings. Because if I'm a young tech company, like the current profit I generate is not a reflection of the profit I might generate in 10 years. Amazon, you know, was losing money every year for a decade plus, but they were gaining market share throughout that decade. They were gaining greater and greater social importance. They were building themselves as an integral part of our everyday lives, both in cloud computing and in retail. Because of that, they traded at a huge multiple over earnings. Um, could be really good research and development. Companies that hire young, smart CS PhDs, for example, might be increasing in value as they're getting better and better employees, uh, new corporate leadership. But all this fundamental stuff, I mean, these are the things that companies report in their annual earnings, the kind of stuff you can observe on the paper. Uh, the momentum side, a lot more complicated. Uh, the momentum side is really just, if people agree something's gonna happen, as I said, they force it to happen. So GameStop was trading at $62 a share in 2007. It declined to $5 a share by August, 2020. Why? Well, brick and mortar retail was really popular in 2007 because of companies like Amazon, like who goes into a GameStop store now to buy video games? You don't even need the physical video game anymore, right? Like I'm sure video game downloads, you could look at the data on when we started downloading our video games versus buying them in person. And that would be a huge decline in the price of GameStop, right? Because that's re related to their fundamental value. I believe you. I've not been in a GameStop since probably 2007, uh, to be totally honest with you. So we have this large decline in their value associated with fundamentals. And then what happens in January 2021? Meme stonks, right? Like this retail, we're going to take on Wall Street. We're going to like push a short squeeze. So there's some mechanics of Wall Street happening in the background about the bets that Wall Street was making on GameStop. Uh, some retail investors on Wall Street bets got their money together, started pushing up the, sh the share price, essentially to stick it to the man, to stick it to these big retail or these big commercial investment uh, funds. Uh, and in the end, who ends up profiting? The big commercial guys. Uh, they saw what was happening. They understand how to read momentum. They bought in at 100, lived it up to, to 300, and then cut the bottom out and started selling. And when the big guys sell, price goes down quickly. I mean, think about a supply and demand graph. Uh, this is the momentum story here for stock price. We have price, quantity, right? So if, if we all agree GameStop's a good buy, like big demand increase from all this Reddit movement going on, the price was low, we're pushing it up, pushing it up. And then the big investors get in. And they push us way up in price. And then a few of us smaller investors sell out at the top. Not really going to change the overall demand for this asset. Not really going to change the price of this asset. And then what happens when the big guys decide to sell out? Oh, we have that huge move back to the, the original demand curve. So the big uh, large investment funds made a lot of money off of GameStop. Retail investors, individual investors, unclear. Some people made a lot of money. Some people are still in it thinking they're holding the line. Um, if you own GameStop, dear God, sell it soon. Uh, especially if you bought it near 10, dear God. Uh, but this is like a great example of a momentum play, right? Like because of something totally orthogonal to fundamental value, prices are increasing. And once they start increasing, it's some combination of momentum and FOMO. Like what you should do is buy high and, or, or sorry, buy low, sell high. <laughs> What you want to do, though, is you see prices going up. You don't want to get left out. You buy in. And that's exactly why I bought gold at $192 and it's trading at $178 now. Uh, I was so afraid it was going to happen. I didn't want to be left out. I finally bought it. Literally, I mean, I think it is at the exact peak. I think I bought the highest possible price of gold <laughs> for the GLD ETF I own. Um, so fingers crossed for really bad inflation. That'll help me out. So apparently, stock is still at 118 that's ridiculous. Still divorced from fundamentals. Oh. What's going to happen when the stock bubble finally pops? I guarantee GameStop is not going to be trading anywhere near even the $10 or $5 it was originally trading at. That is going to go close to zero. I, I mean, I'm sure. So this is totally separate from what we're going to be talking about. But it's a really interesting position if you are like on the board at GameStop. Because nothing you're doing drove the price up. But when the price goes up, like board members own lots of shares, there's a lot more cash flow available to the company when the price is that high. 
maybe they made some really good investments and increased their fundamental value. Could they have increased it to 118? I mean, I don't think there's a 30 Xing or a 20 Xing of their like $5 share price just from this influx of cash flow. I don't think it changes the fundamentals that like GameStop's a dying industry. Uh, maybe though, I mean, that they can do clever things. If you get caught up in this momentum as a company, like you have extra cash to play with. Uh, I'm shocked that GameStop's still trading as high as it is. I think a lot of it though is because there's, people are just making so many side bets on it. Mm -hmm. Like if you take out margin to be gambling on this, if you're shorting it, there's just all these other pressures that we won't talk about at all today. Um, we're going to talk about like traditional buying and holding of stocks because it turns out that's how you get rich. Uh, buy a good portfolio of stocks and forget you own it. Don't tinker, wait 40 years, wake up with money. Um, that kind of is the game. Uh, we'll talk a bit about beating the market later. It's, it's a hard thing to do. Um, okay, so we talked about this fundamental value. Uh, some common statistics to think about fundamental value. Price earnings ratio is a great first principle to think about. It's literally the share price of the company as a multiple of the earnings of that company. Uh, I can either do it forward, so over projected earnings for the next year, or trailing over the literal earnings for the last 52 weeks. Either way, the PE, a, a nice way to tell if a stock is sort of like overvalued or undervalued relative to their earnings. Now, there's not some PE value that is like the break even for a good valuation or a bad valuation. It's very industry specific, but PEs are a great way to compare close competitors. So if I have like Nike, Adidas, New Balance, all in a similar field with very different PE ratios, Nike, let's say has a 25 PE and Adidas has a 10, I would want to buy Adidas, right? Because relative to their earnings, they're being undervalued in the same industry as Nike. So a high price earnings means that the market really likes you compared to your revenue. So what's a way to buy based on fundamental value? Buy the low price earning ratio firms in a given industry. They're more likely than not, if they can maintain their earnings, their price will catch up to those earnings over time. High PE companies, their price is exceeding their earnings. They're more likely to sort of revert to the mean. Um, PE is a great first uh, principle and market caps, another great, just like first snapshot at a company. Uh, I think it's really tempting to see the price of a stock and think that conveys any information. Price conveys zero information. Price changes over time convey information if a stock's appreciating or depreciating. Um, but as an example, Boeing trades at 198 a share, Apple trades at 164 a share. Boeing's market cap is like a 20th of Apple's market cap. Right? The relevant measure isn't the price of your stock. It's the price of your stock times the number of stocks outstanding. If you have a low price, but a ton of stocks out there, you're going to have a very, very high market cap. And market cap is kind of like the size of the company. So when we're talking about like mega cap, big firms, it's market caps over, I think mega cap is a hundred billion. Please edit me with the computer all throughout this. Um, uh, it's at least 20 billion. 20 billion. Okay. So we've got some super mega caps. 200. 200. Okay. Sorry. Thank you. Uh, so Boeing just under a mega cap. <laughs> Apple, like a super cap firm, right? But market cap is just a relevant way of sort of sorting companies. And why is it relevant? Uh, companies with like a, I mean, <laughs> Apple has a, almost a $3 trillion market cap. Uh, that's kind of the total value of Apple. It's worth $3 trillion because these are all shares of ownership. All the owners times the price that you would have to pay to become an owner, $3 trillion. That's like a sixth of US GDP. Uh, it's bigger than the GDP of, I think, almost all of Europe. I mean, like huge, huge, huge company. So market cap, another nice sort of like first fundamental statistic. Um, beta is another one that's really, really nice and convenient. I'll show you in a little bit when we think about pricing assets, why beta is so useful. Um, the beta of a stock is just a measure of a stock's volatility relative to the market. Um, who here has taken like a stats class? Who's seen a linear regression? So this beta, literally the formula for a linear regression, right? If I was to measure like a beta, a coefficient that cuts through a series of points, how I get that beta is the covariance of the X and Y variable over the total variance of the Y variable. So the beta of a stock is how much that stock covariates with the market as a whole. If beta is greater than one, that means if the market goes up by 1%, the stock's going to go up by more than 1%. If the market goes down by 1%, the stock on average will go down by more than 1%. Uh, 
So it's just a nice way of knowing, like, if I have a sense of what the total market is doing, I can see if this firm is either more or less volatile than the market as a whole. Okay. So we already said bonds return 5.7% annually, equities return 9.1% on average. This is after adjusting for inflation. Uh, why are equities so much more valuable? Why do they give us so much more yield than a bond does? Yeah, they're way, way riskier. The only way the bond doesn't pay you back is if the company fails. Equities go to zero if the company fails too, but they could also increase, decrease, whatever, for a bunch of other reasons, both fundamental and non-fundamental. So because there's so much more that is involved in the price of an equity, they generally have a higher return. Um, the equity premium, that's the multiple of, well, not the multiple, but the difference between the return on an equity and the return on a bond. Equity premium has always been uh, like four to 6%. So equities return a lot more than bonds do on average. Uh, that might change in the near future if we get some super high inflation. Super high inflation could really hurt uh, stock valuation and it could really help the, the return on bonds. A 30-year government bond in the 1980s, I think returned like 15% annually because there was high inflation. So if you can buy a 30-year bond at 15% for 30 years, the government gives you a 15% return. Inflation probably won't stay at 15% for that long. Uh, so there might be some good opportunities with inflation to buy bonds. Since sort of like the great moderation of the, the early 1990s until now, um, bonds have not been a very sexy investment. They're really hard to make a high return on exactly because inflation is so low. Therefore, the borrowing cost for firms is pretty low. Okay. Um, some other fundamental metrics. We'll talk through some of these a little bit later. Uh, discounted cash flow, dividend discount model, capital asset pricing model. These are just terms you're going to hear people throw out there. Um, so like DCF valuations. Uh, talk about, I suppose, all of them are, well, at least DCF and dividend and discount are just going to be variations on a bond pricing formula. We'll walk through a bond pricing formula in a bit. Essentially, all it's doing is projecting future cash flow and then discounting that cash flow to the current period, right? So I first have to make an estimate of how much money I think you're going to make over the next year, two years, 10 years, however long. And then I discount it back with some appro appropriate discount factor. And it turns out that appropriate discount factor is the risk-free rate. So we're gonna get back to the idea of why that risk-free rate is so important. Um, it's the return you get for a riskless investment. Therefore, any risky investment has to be measured against that riskless investment. And we'll just see that come up in a few different formulas. All three of these formulas, the risk-free rate plays a really important role in pricing an asset. Okay. So a dividend, something I think I defined uh, and blew through earlier. Yeah, dividends, it's essentially like um, kind of like a bond component to stock ownership. A dividend is a cash payment shareholders get out of quarterly profit. Dividends are usually, um, firms that offer them offer pretty consistent dividends over time. Not always the same percentage of share price because share price will change, but a similar like dividend per share. Um, and a natural question is, why doesn't everyone pay a dividend, right? Like, if I get a dividend, I both get the appreciation of my stock and I get a quarterly payment. I kind of get the, the best of both worlds, sort of the, the cash flow of a bond and the appreciation of a stock. So why wouldn't every company want to offer a dividend? Less attractive stock or like more attractive companies would not need a dividend, like an incentive kind of? Yes, yeah, you wouldn't necessarily need it. What's the other thing you'd be doing with that money if you didn't pay it out as a dividend? Exactly. So dividends are uh, really common for like big developed companies that sort of know where their income's coming from, know what their like uh, their edge in the market is that aren't necessarily looking for growth. Uh, really, usually these large stable companies. So that appreciate slowly over time. Think AT&T, Coca-Cola, like big established brands. Uh, they can pay a dividend because they're super profitable. They've been in business for quite some time. But if I'm like Tesla, do I want to pay a dividend? No, I want to plow every single dollar into making sure my cars don't have to get recalled every three quarters, right? I want to plow every single dollar into research and development. So dividend stocks, high dividend stocks are awesome uh, for older investors. As you get older, um, if you find yourself in 40 years, I'm upswing in the market, times are good, you can cash out. 
shift your money away from like the really high growth stuff to the really nice stable dividend paying stuff. AT&T pays a 7.7% dividend. 7% return, if you already have a million dollars, is good money, right? Trying to earn that million in the first place, you're not going to get there on dividend stocks. At least it's going to be a lot harder because they're giving up the prospect of becoming really, really high growth. So what you'll see a lot of time, like the lifetime of an investor, when you're young, a lot of growth stocks, a lot of things that are sort of like slightly higher risk. You're not sure if they're all going to pan out, younger companies, but the ones that do really are going to pay off. And then once you get paid from those growth stocks, shift over to the more stable dividend paying stocks, the ones that have established brands that you know are going to be there. Um, so sort of just an idea of how to balance risk over a lifetime. Another thought here, we talked about PE ratios, like what's a good PE ratio? And I just want to point out, it's really firm and industry specific. So when I'm thinking of price earnings ratios, if I'm thinking of comparing fundamental value, I always have to compare apples to apples. I want to make sure I'm really thinking about firms that are similar. Um, AT&T has a PE ratio of 8.6. Uh, Tesla has a PE of 167. Um, that's weird too, because Tesla 167 PE, meaning their share price is 167 times their earnings. Ford, a four PE ratio. Their share price is only four times their earnings, even though they're both car companies. Um, why is that the case? Well, some would argue that Tesla isn't really a car company, it's more I, of a technology company. Well, I think that's the exact argument. They're not really a car company. I mean, they make cars, but they're kind of trying to be something else. Uh, also, Electric vehicles, the new sexy thing, investment in lithium. They have, uh, I think Tesla probably has some pretty great patents that will eventually, you know, when Ford and GM and these other companies start doing more electric, uh, it might be revenue for Tesla as well. Um, also, Elon Musk. I mean, the founder effect. People like Elon Musk, uh, or at least pay attention to him. Uh, what he does moves markets. Absolutely follow his tweets and the price of Bitcoin. Uh, he moves that market as much as anything does. So uh, maybe it's, it is the case Tesla's not a car company. This is also a reason a lot of people have bought Ford in the last year. Um, it's why I bought Ford. Ford also is trying to be an electric vehicle company. Uh, so if they're trading at a four PE ratio, Tesla's trading at a 167. Let's say traditional auto manufacturer, very low price earnings because there's not much room for growth. Electric manufacturer, very high price earnings. I would expect Tesla's PE to come down and Ford's to go up over the next decade as Ford and GM and Nissan and the other car companies make that electric transition. But who knows, maybe there's something totally different about Tesla. Just pointing this out and that there's, there's no real rules for PE ratios. Um, what I wanna do though, is try and put fundamentals in context. I always wanna think about who are the closest competitors for this company and how do I think about that? Firms tell you, uh, read their quarterly and annual reports that all publicly traded companies have to publish. They'll tell you who they think their competition set is look at price earnings ratios compared to that competition set. Do some market research on your own. I mean, any of the trading sites have close competitors. Think about who those close competitors are. Um, and the comparison really is going to be, again, like for like, is this company over or undervalued? Okay, any questions so far? Okay, I'm just gonna cruise through this next part. Um, I do wanna start with this question though, just intuitively. So let's pretend I was gonna offer you $100 10 years from now, what amount of money would I have to give you today for you to be indifferent between those two options? And assume zero inflation. Uh, it'd be wonderful if that were the case. It's not inflation seven and a half percent right now. Pretend it's not. Pretend I'm giving you like the purchasing power of hundred dollars now, just 10 years from now. How much money would you want today to make this trade? Would anyone require more than hundred dollars today to make the trade? Do we all agree less? Yeah. How much less? Nobody wants to bid first? Smart strategy. <laughs> Never be the first to bid. 50? Okay. 50 seems reasonable. I mean, I'm still sitting at like 20, 25. 25 seems reasonable. I mean, for you personally, right? 25 might make sense because in 10 years, Hopefully, dear God, for your sake, I hope you're not still college students. Uh, so you'll have some actual, it took me master's doctorate, close, close to that 10. Uh, hopefully, God, 
for your sake. You won't. Um, but even pretending like it wasn't an income story, even if you knew your income would be stable over this time period, there's some sense in which money now is worth more than money in the future. Because what could I do if I had money now? Invest it or spend it. And spending now makes me happier than the idea of spending 10 years from now. Um, this is the time value of money. This concept underlies all asset pricing. The idea that any future money, I have to discount to figure out its fair value today. So that, that natural intuitive thing we just went through, $100 in the future is worth less now. That is the insight that allows me to price a bond. That is the insight that allows me to do a discounted cash flow analysis. All I'm doing is looking at some future payoff and using an appropriate discount factor to adequately price it today. So we need a risk-free rate to do that because at the very least, what could you do with money I gave you now? You could invest it risk-free. You could buy a 10-year US government bond completely risk-free and it would give you some return. So that return better be the very bare minimum you would accept for any uh, amount of money. And that's actually precisely how we use the time value of money to discount some future asset. So in this example, this is the asset pricing formula. Present value is whatever the future value is divided by one plus the interest rate to the number of years I have to wait. So in this example, if there's a 3% interest rate, $100 in 10 years should be worth $74 today. Now, why did some of you say less than $74? Maybe you think you can get more than 3% return. Maybe you're also impatient. So I have to combine the literal return you'd get with just your natural preference for more now versus the future. Both of those are fine. But if I'm a company, like making my cold calculated break-even analysis of an investment, this is what we think of when we think of like a hurdle rate for a company. Do I get enough return on my investment now that that future amount of money it gets me is worth the upfront amount today? And what should I use for that hurdle rate? I should use whatever I'd have to borrow at. The risk-free rate is the bottom of what I would have to borrow at. It might be some higher multiple if I'm a riskier investment. Again, that's gonna come down to the rating agencies we talked about before. But this formula, I mean, it literally is all asset pricing. It comes down to this notion of time value of money. So uh, again, here's an example of rearranging it. Um, of course, I could solve this equation for the future value. So if I invest $100 at a 5% interest rate for 35 years worth $551 in 35 years. So you can, again, project out how much something will be worth in the future or discount something in the future till now. Super powerful equation for all asset pricing. Um, if you took a finance course, most of the course is just iterations of playing with this formula. But we can do uh, an actual like bond application. I'm not going to go through the math here. It's all written. But basically, how do I calculate the fair price for a bond? If I know the coupon payment, right, that's the yield, 5% on the bond times the face value I paid. So annual coupon of 5% pays me in 10 years. Assume a 3% risk-free rate. I know the fair price for this bond today. Right? I discount the future payoff in 10 years by so like the discount rate to the 10th power. And then I use the summation that you know, my first coupon payment, I discount by one year, my second by two years, my third by three years, and so on. But again, it just collapses back some stream of future income to a present value. Uh, this is exactly how a DCF model works as well. A DCF model, I make some predictions about the revenue a firm's going to have. I make some prediction about the cost of capital for that firm. I can discount back my projected revenue stream to a, a fair value today. And if my DCF value says the fair price for this stock is above its trading price, buy the stock. If the fair price for the stock is below its trading price, don't buy the stock. Right? So it's just a nice tool for evaluating if something over or underpriced. Uh, but again, a DCF valuation, you have code that does that, right? That, the club has access to? We should. You should. I'm um, sorry, the finance club should have, uh, I think there's a document where there's like a DCF valuation already written up. All you have to do is layer in the assumptions you're making about growth, about projected revenue, and about cost of capital. But all it is an application of the time value of money, right? It's just applying this simple intuitive formula to a longer stream of future payments. Okay. So when you're trading equities, We've talked a little bit about what kind of assets you buy, like equities or stocks. Um, this is true in general when you're trading anything. What are you trying to do? Well, identify stocks whose current price is less than it should be, either based on a DCF valuation 
based on some projection you're making with cap M identify a stock that's undervalued, find a person who disagrees with you, right? You need someone on the other side of the trade, find someone who thinks the stock is overvalued or who's rebalancing their portfolio, or for some reason wants to sell, buy from that sucker and get rich, right? Like that's the whole objective view. You want to be right when someone else is wrong. You have to like, if I think this is a buy, I need someone else to think it's a sell, meaning we have different beliefs about the exact same asset, but those different beliefs allow the market to function. So my goal is to beat the market. Um, and what I want to say about beating the market, well, first we have to define the market. What do I mean by the market? What is that? That's one version of the market. Depends on what, what you want to look at. Yeah, it depends on the market you're competing with. S&P 500, that's what I think of when I think of the market every time. Um, it refers to a weighted average of all stocks traded in a marketplace. Typically, we're thinking of major U.S. stock indices. S&P 500 is sort of, I mean, that's always what I'm thinking of because it's a weighted average of the value of the 500 biggest firms in America. It gives me a good snapshot of what the most biggest by market cap, but of what the largest firms in America are doing. At the S&P 500, on average, it goes up inflation adjusted about 9% a year. So to beat the market, I have to get a more than 9% a year return, right? Alternatively, I could use the Dow. I could use NASDAQ. I have definitions of what those are. Um, I think S&P 500 probably makes the most sense. Maybe the Russell 2000 is a benchmark. For you all uh, in the finance club, Russell 2000 is probably your benchmark because those are the only stocks you're allowed to buy. So it makes sense to be competing against that benchmark of stocks. But either when we're saying the market, which I say has an annual return of roughly 9%, this is what the market looks like over time. Um, this is me just going to Fred. Everybody knows Fred data, right? Federal Reserve Board of St. Louis, uh, publicly available data. Literally, I went to Fred, typed in SP 500, changed it from the val index value to percent change, and this beautiful time series graph pops out. Uh, if you write a macro adjacent thesis, get really comfortable with Fred data. It's so nice to get these visualizations out. It's so quick and easy. Um, but this is what the market does. On average, returns around 9%. Sometimes less, sometimes negative, sometimes hyper negative, of late, crazy high. Um, and it just sort of chugs along over time, returning a pretty good average return, but with high volatility, right? Bonds, much more stable return. Uh, you don't have the ups and downs. You don't have those sort of natural swings, but you miss the upside, which is on average, 9% return is pretty damn good. That means whatever your portfolio is, it doubles every eight years if you earn a 9% return. Doubling every eight years is how you get super rich. Um, that's compound growth, and it's really, really powerful. Okay, so we have a market, S&P 500. This is what a market, let's call the S&P 500, what it looks like. Uh, the terms that you'll hear a lot in finance, bull market, when the market's up 20% relative to the most recent trough. So a strong bull market since the COVID crash, right? Way more than a 20% increase relative to the bottom out here. This was a good bear market, more than a 20% decrease in value when COVID first hits. And we know that bull and bear markets are coming. Uh, on average, you get 3.6 years between bear markets. Sometimes it's longer. Um, I don't know what the longest is in the last 100 years. I don't think the longest, <clears throat> I think this actually might've been one of the longest bull markets. This might've been it. Uh, almost 10 years, eight years before a bear market. <clears throat> but on average, 3.6 years, um, a bear market lasts under a year on average. Bull markets, again, this is just 3.6 minus 9.6 months, must mean a bull market lasts 2.7 uh, years. So again, a, a natural instinct is to want to buy low, sell high. Uh, no cycles are coming. Like know that eventually things are going to cycle through. The problem is you can't time them. Just because you know the market's going to go down eventually doesn't mean it's going to go down soon and doesn't mean that like waiting is your best strategy. Uh, as an example of that, the 2001 dot-com bubble bursting, late 2000, early 2001, uh, that was being predicted by economists and financial professionals as early as 1997. Uh, everybody knew the market was overpriced and it ran up like another two or three times in value uh, over that three-year period. So if in 97, you pulled all your money out and waited for the dip and bought the dip, you'd be less better off than if you just let your money run, 
let it completely crash and let it pick up again. Um, the worst thing you can do is be out of the market if you have the money to be in it. Because over time, on average, it just goes up. Even if you think you're buying near the top, it seems to make sense to buy into this. Um, it really is the best way to gain long-term wealth. So we talked about beta a bit. I just want to show really quickly, um, beta is such a great measure. It's, it's, I mean, literally like beta in a linear regression. It's the regression coefficient of a stock's value relative to the market value. But if I know that, uh, I can now use beta to predict a return of any stock. So this is the capital asset pricing model. You might've heard the term CAPM. Um, people throw it around like CAPM valuation for something. It's very, very simple. The expected return on any asset is gonna be the risk-free rate. It has to be some multiple above the risk-free rate. Otherwise, why would you buy it? If it's risky, you're gonna to have to get a higher return than a riskless investment gives you. And then you add the stock's volatility relative to the market. So if I think the market's gonna return 10%, uh, and then my beta is 0.9, I'm slightly less volatile than the market. Risk free rate is 1.6%. I expect my stock to return 9.16% over time. So beta, a good way to pick stocks. Again, if you're young and you think the market's going to go up, high beta stocks are a great investment opportunity. If you're older and you're concerned about a downturn, low beta stocks are a better investment opportunity because even if the market crashes, you don't want your portfolio to crash as much. So based on this previous slide, if we're assuming positive returns, which again, there's no reason we should assume returns are always positive, but if we do, what's a really easy way to beat the market? Only buy high beta stocks. Every time the market goes up, your stock goes up by more than the market. So how do you beat the market? Just take on riskier stocks and you're always beating it. Um, the problem is if the market goes down, you go down by more than the market. So when we talk about beating the market, this is, I think, something that is maybe one of the most misre misrepresented concepts, um, beating the market is not getting a better return than the market. If you bought GameStop, you didn't beat the market. You had a very high return, a higher than market return, which is wonderful. Beating the market is on a risk-adjusted basement, basement basis. So if you beat the market by owning one stock, that's a very risky investment strategy. Of course, you might be rewarded for that very risky investment strategy. You also might be rewarded from buying a lottery ticket highly, highly risky with a huge potential payout. If you win the lottery, please don't brag about beating the market. That's not what happened. You accepted an absurd amount of risk and you happen to be the lucky person who got paid off. So when I'm thinking about beating the market, constructing a portfolio, my entire goal, modern portfolio theory, uh, not that modern. I think the paper in Markowitz was 1956 or 1954. Uh, but the concept behind constructing a portfolio I want to maximize returns subject to risk. So to beat the market, I have to not only beat the market in terms of my return, I have to have less risk than the marketplace. I was going to say, like, is there a non-modern portfolio theory? Like, what were people doing before? Uh, I don't know. I don't know what people were doing before. I, I suppose it wasn't formalized, the idea of diversification. Um, so this is really just formalizing what a diversified portfolio looks like. Um, with the idea being that there's two types of risk. Systemic risk is market-wide risk. So let, I don't know, COVID-19, a global financial crisis, Russia invading Ukraine. Those feel like systemic risks. Maybe some companies benefit, but the whole market at writ large is going to suffer when these things happen. Specific risk are the risks to individual companies or sectors. So with an oil company, a specific risk might be all of us waking up and realizing that the environment is going to shit and transitioning to clean energy. That's a specific risk to the oil industry that like, I don't know, Nike doesn't necessarily have to worry about in the same way. Uh, so specific risks, industry level risks are the things that we should exactly be minimizing by having a well-balanced portfolio. How do I do that? Diversifying. Diversifying is the mechanism to get rid of specific risk. So I try and buy stocks with complementary risk portfolios. I own a lot of solar stocks. I own a solar ETF. Um, I'm betting that that is something that will take off over the next 20 to 30 years. I want those in my portfolio. I also own Exxon because uh, if I'm wrong, I don't want my money to just go away. It's not that I think Exxon's a great company. It's not that I'm like believing in them and rooting for them. It's that if solar doesn't take off, what's the alternative? Probably oil and gas. I have a little bit of nuclear. I have a little bit of lithium as well, just in case, 
right? That's diversification of these specific risks of an industry. Question? I know, like, I don't know, I bought like a kind of green energy ETF, but it was more so looking at um, what companies have the largest market for investment in green energy. So, like, Exxon and um, Chevron and companies like that were like most of the ETFs just because, as organizations, they have way more money. That yeah. Put energy. Yeah. Is that like something you consider in diversification, or is it more just kind of like bless simple? you? Uh, yeah, that absolutely should be. So that that's actually why like diversifying with ETFs is sometimes tricky, um, because yeah, sometimes what's in an ETF isn't what you think would be there. Like for example, most ESG funds like have like Amazon and Facebook as part of their holdings. I don't think of those as being particularly socially responsible firms. Mm -hmm. But uh, Amazon buys a lot of carbon offsets. So they're like on the ESG metric, they're pretty high. Uh, yeah, I think just because you've bought like several ETFs, it doesn't mean you're diversified. It, it really is the underlying stocks in all those portfolios, exactly. Um, so yeah, I, I'd say like for the solar ETFs I have, they are solar companies specifically. Uh, some of them might be invested in by Exxon, but they're kind of a different play than Exxon's trying to be. But yeah, that's exactly why you have to read the fine print when you buy an asset. You want to know what they're actually being exposed to. Um, yeah. So the whole idea, oh, I'm sorry, question, yeah. Um, so if you're like kind of hedging your rest by investing in both things in case either option happens, how do you make money, right? Like, because, you know, if the green energy thing doesn't take off, isn't one of those Talk to go down, like. Sure, but what if they both kind of do okay? I mean, solar has done pretty well over the last 40 years, as has oil and gas. So it's not to say that like they can't both succeed on some other underlying push, which is yeah. the world is getting wealthier and therefore consuming more energy and therefore probably needs energy from multiple sources. But they're also hedges against each other specifically. Mm -hmm. So you, I mean, you wouldn't want a portfolio that perfectly offsets itself, right? Because then you're always making zero dollars of profit. But things that have different risk portfolios that have different underlying risks that are going to like really hamper their potential to be successful companies, that sort of were like, okay, if oil fails, I bet solar has really taken off or nuclear has really taken off. There's a non-trivial chance all three of those are still successful 30 years from now. Um, yeah. Does so that answer it, the question? Yeah. Like, is it better to hedge, like get sort of make sure that no matter what happens, you're okay? Or, or like, would you recommend... Like getting stocks from things that are kind of unrelated so that like they don't, you know. I mean, I, I, what, what I would recommend like, is to not listen to my advice on investment. Okay, I'm, I mean, I'm like, genuinely, because I, I'm not a financial professional. I'm just thinking about some of this broadly. Uh, it really depends on your risk tolerance. Like how much risk do you want to take? Mm -hmm. If you are thinking like right now, I'm putting money into the market. I'm going to keep plowing it in. I really want to earn a 15% return. Well, you don't want your investments offsetting each other then. You want to kind of, I mean, be a little under diversified and piled into things that all might go up in the same way. Yeah. Um, as a young investor, I think that's a super fair thing to do. Taking high risk now uh, means you have the potential to be very wealthy, uh, whereas being exposed at all the market means you're probably not going to be more poor. Uh, as you get older, less and less risk in your portfolio makes sense. But that comes down to personal preference, you know, like if you as an individual are really comfortable with risk, have a less diversified portfolio. If you as an individual hate risk, have a lot of bonds in your portfolio and only buy like, you know, S&P mimicking ETFs and you'll probably be pretty safe. I guess, I guess maybe part of my question is sort of when you say diversification, is it diversification? Because both the example you gave, both of them were the energy. Sure, sure, sure. Across other sectors too. Buying across sectors. Exactly. Well. That's what I sort of meant by yeah, yeah, yeah. not buying things that might necessarily like theoretically be competitors. But sure. Like you buy something here and you buy something here. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. So yes, and right. I want both complementary portfolios of stocks. I don't want just one energy company and one retail company okay. and like you know, one banking company. Yeah. I might want multiple companies from each of those sectors and then a lot of different sectors represented in yeah, so multiple sectors. Exactly. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I finally got to the question. No, I, I sort yeah. of didn't know what I was asking. I was. <laughs> yeah, so both definitely. Um, and really, because what you're looking for is you want to minimize the covariance of your stock portfolio relative to the return you're looking for, mm -hmm. right? So like the covariance of energy sector stocks might all go up or all go down for some underlying energy reason, or they might have different risk portfolios for the solar versus oil thing. But energy stocks, probably have different variations in their like profitability than commercial real estate stocks. 
than like Nike and Adidas and other retail companies. So I want to make sure that the stocks I have all can grow for their own reasons, might grow for different reasons. So they're not all moving in like, they don't all have the same variation with the overall market. Uh, and, and that really minimizing covariance subject to a given return is literally modern portfolio theory. Uh, this is the risk is the covariance of my portfolio the, the, or the total variation of my portfolio. The expected return is what on average these yield over time. And the way I construct a portfolio is some balance of government bonds and the optimal portfolio that, again, what is like, how would I literally solve this efficient frontier? I could look at a bunch of different portfolios of every company you could invest in. I could look at all the convex combinations of those investments. I could backfit them for expected return with the lowest variation. And that's what's going to create this frontier, right? So if I really don't like risk, I would be down here. If I really do like risk, I'd be up here. The inside of modern portfolio theory is you can do better by just balancing this risky uh, portfolio with a riskless asset. So if I'm along here, for this amount of risk, I have a higher return than a basket of equities could possibly give me and the same amount of risk. And if I go up here, same idea. For a given amount of risk, I can get even higher return. How is it that I would buy more than this basket? Well, along this point of the capital market line, I'm borrowing at the risk-free rate. So this is like investing on margin at this point. And this is a portfolio balance between the risk-free rate, government bonds, and equities. But this theory... Again, I said at the beginning, like the idea of U.S. Treasuries as a risk-free asset underlies all of financial theory, both because how I price assets is using the risk-free rate as the appropriate discount factor, and how I construct a portfolio is balancing a bunch of risk-free assets with a risky, uh, a risky bundle of stocks. So an example of this would be like, I hold some U.S. Treasuries and the SPY ETF, which mimics the S&P 500, that's something along this line. If I borrow, if I use margin, so I borrow at the risk-free rate to buy even more uh, of like these risky assets, even more of SPY, still efficient, just much higher risk. But again, giving me the opportunity for higher expected return. Okay. So modern portfolio, again, this graph is like a very lovely uh, way of thinking about it. All you're doing, minimizing total variance subject to expected return. But when we talk about, so here's ETFs to find. I talk about these enough that I'll just cruise through it. Um, but what are you actually trying to do to beat the market? You're trying to get at least the market level return with less risk or a lower return than the market with much lower risk than the market. Just to having a higher return it has nothing to do with beating the market. I have to know about the covariance of your portfolio, um, which is why if you ever go with an investment advisor and all they show you is like last year, we beat the market by X percent. That's why you need a lot of years. I need to see what you're doing on average. I need to see, uh, I mean, I have a friend who works for an investment firm in, uh, what's Silicon Valley, Jesus Christ. I don't know why that was so hard to come up with. Um, he just quit actually because his whole job was trying to find a good benchmark to prove that his firm was doing their job right. Um, so in a year where they didn't beat the S&P 500, he would have to like, okay, did we beat the Russell 2000? Did we beat the Dow? What's the right comparison to show our, our investors that we actually beat the market? How do I prove that we have lower risk? Like, let me look at the covariance of our portfolio compared to that, again, both the return and variation in the S&P 500 in the Dow and make those comparisons. A lot of finance is just moving around the numbers to make whatever you did look better than it was. Smart. Yeah, exactly. So you as an investor need to know what you're looking for. Superior risk adjusted return. That's it. And the benchmark they choose, uh, they better really be able to defend as the logical benchmark. If they're not a tech, if, if your portfolio isn't a bunch of tech companies, they shouldn't compare you to NASDAQ, even if the NASDAQ makes them look good, because NASDAQ is primarily tech companies. Um, can, you, can you tell us a little bit about those benchmarks? Because like you mentioned three, I think. It's the S&P 500. S&P 500, NASDAQ, Dow Jones. Um, the, the one that Russell 2000, yeah, uh, uh, it's the 2000 largest firms okay. um, in the United States. As opposed to the 500. As opposed to the 500. And then I think the S&P 500 is market cap weighted. And the, I think the Russell might only be weighted by like, each firm has equal weight. It's not dependent on the market cap, but I'm not totally sure. Um, you can look, I mean, all that's on Investopedia. Just look up like different markets. Um, 
Last things I want to show. Uh, so is the market overpriced? Are stocks overvalued right now? These are like the, this is the PE ratio for the whole market. Um, meaning, remember what PE ratio is? The price stocks trade at relative to their earnings. Uh, historically, it was around 15 from 1880 until uh, 1990. It's been a lot higher of late. Uh, we're trading at a much higher multiple over earnings than we historically had. Uh, this is why a lot of people think that we're in for a really ugly market correction for a very bad bear market. Because what's happened every time these PE ratios have gotten high? Well, this is the Great Depression. This is the 2008 financial crisis. This is where we are right now, roughly. Uh, so it seems like whenever these things happen, a crash follows. But we're also in a really weird environment. This is the risk-free rate thing we've been talking about. Remember what the risk-free rate does. The lower it is, the less I discount future cash. Risk-free rate has been going from you know almost 20% in the 1980s. Again, this is that era where you could buy Fuck, this is a one-year treasury paying you 20% annual return. Pretty cool return uh, because inflation was slightly less than that, but inflation has been low. The Fed's been really loose with their policy. Interest rates have been rock bottom. So maybe things aren't overpriced. Maybe they're accurately priced because we don't have to discount the future that much. Um, this little uptick should scare you. This is interest rates right now, and they're starting to go up. And I promise you, they're going to be higher next year than they are right now. Uh, the Fed's thinking about six rate increases this year, potentially. Uh, what's that do to the future projected revenue? Drives down its value. So this is why the stock market pays so much attention to what the Fed's doing. When the Fed raises interest rates, it decreases the value of all assets because of that time value of money. When they lower interest rates, it increases the value of all assets, right? So the idea that like, if you read the Financial Times, the Wall Street Journal, they're always going to talk about Fed, the Fed minutes, what the Fed's projecting, how long they're going to hold rates. It comes down to this same thing, the time value of money. Higher uh, interest rates mean everything in the future is worth less. Lower interest rates mean everything in the future is worth more. Okay. So again, are we overpriced? I, don't know. I sure think so, but I have really no idea um, because we are in a super unique era. We've never had low interest rates for this long. Um, there is no historical comp as precedent to sort of understand what low interest rates do to long-term valuations. Um, that's the point I was making. Uh, and then, yeah, the goal of personal is being alpha. <laughs> I dropped the Joe Rogan reference this time. It's too, too on the nose these days. Um, but yeah, to have edge. So again, what, what did I say you're supposed to do? Superior risk-adjusted return. That's what alpha is. So if you hear financial professionals talk about alpha or edge, it means on a risk-adjusted basis, they're beating the market. And that is the objective if you're a pro stock picker. You're supposed to have edge. You're supposed to beat the market. Um, a risk-adjusted superior return. As I said, who you benchmark against tells you a lot about firm strategy. That's where they have some wiggle room. Um, the probability of doing this almost zero. Um, so in an average year, S&P 500 outperforms large cap mutual funds by two to 3%. So the people who professionally pick stocks have a lower return than if you just bought an S&P 500 mimic fund. Uh, there's only five years where large cap funds have beat the S&P 500 in that 20 year window. This all comes from an economist article uh, written in 2015. And in six of the 20 years, fewer than a quarter of professionals beat the market. So having edge, is really, really, really hard. Uh, you know who has edge over the market? Nancy Pelosi. Uh, really, it's only a few Congress people that have edge. Uh, and not to beat up on Nancy, I'm sure there's plenty of conservatives who do too. Uh, but man, they crush the market, which is why you can probably tell that our government officials are insider trading. If financial professionals can't beat the market, but some random senator can, Either that's a genius person who is like the greatest civil servant of all time because they're giving up their tremendous edge over the marketplace to serve us in Congress, or they're leveraging the fact that they know about pandemics and they know about Fed policy and they know about all these important things before the rest of us do. Um, so if professionals don't have edge and politicians do, that probably tells you something about the system we're living in. I like to end on that note because it's the most depressing thing I can think to say. Uh, yeah, and that's everything for the presentation. Uh, any of the 